This audiobook is a personal endeavor and is for personal use only. I do hope that you enjoy this audiobook presentation and that it will help to light your pathway in life. 50 Self Help Classics Introduction The greatest discovery of my generation is that a human being can alter his life by altering his attitudes. William James, 1842, 1910 Habits of Thinking Need Not Be Forever. One of the most significant findings in psychology in the last 20 years is that individuals can choose the way they think. Martin Seligman, Learned Optimism You will have heard many times that, you can change your life by changing your thoughts and your mental habits, but have you ever stopped to consider what that means? This book identifies some of the most useful ideas from writings specifically devoted to personal transformation from the inside out. I have called these books, self-help classics. You may already have an idea of what self-help is, but that understanding should be deepened by the range of authors and titles covered in these pages. If there is a thread running through the works, it is their refusal to accept, common unhappiness, or, quiet desperation, as the lot of humankind. They acknowledge life's difficulties and setbacks as real, but say that we cannot be defined by these. No matter how adverse the situation, we always have room to determine what it will mean to us, a lesson given us in two books covered here, Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning and Bothius the Consolation of Philosophy. To consciously decide what we will think, not allowing genes or environment or fate to determine our path this is the essence of self-help. A conventional view of self-help is that it deals with problems, but most of the self-help classics are about possibilities. They can help reveal your unique course in life, form a bridge between fear and happiness, or simply inspire you to be a better person. Samuel Smiles wrote the original self-help in 1859. He feared that people would think his book a tribute to selfishness. In fact it preached reliance on one's own efforts, the never-say-die pursuit of a goal that did not wait on government help or any other kind of patronage. Smiles was originally a political reformer, but came to the conclusion that the real revolutions happened inside people's heads. He took the greatest idea of his century, progress, and applied it to personal life. Through telling the life stories of some of the remarkable people of his era, he tried to show that anything was possible if you had the gall to try. Abraham Lincoln is sometimes mentioned in self help writing because he embodies the idea of limitless thinking. Yet his thoughts were not applied to himself, he considered himself an ungainly depressive, but to the potential he saw in a situation, saving the Union and freeing America of slavery. Lincoln's vision was not vainglorious he lived for something larger. At its best, self-help is not about the fantasies of the ego, but involves the identification of a project, goal, ideal, or way of being where you can make a big difference. In so doing, you can transform a piece of the world and yourself along with it. The Self-Help Phenomenon The symbols of the divine show up in our world initially at the trash stratum. Philip K. Dick Vallis. The self-help book was one of the great success stories of the 20th century. The exact number purchased is impossible to calculate, but this selection of 50 classics alone has sold over 150 million copies between them, and if we consider the thousands of other titles the final number would run to more than half a billion. The idea of self-help is nothing new but only in the 20th century did it become a mass phenomenon. Books like How to Win Friends and Influence People, 1936, and The Power of Positive Thinking, 1952, were bought by ordinary people desperate to make something of their lives and willing to believe that the secrets of success could be found in a paperback. Maybe the genre took on its lowbrow image because the books were so readily available, promised so much and contained ideas that you were unlikely to hear from a professor or a minister. Whatever the image, people obviously had a new source of life guidance and they loved it. For once, we were not being told what we couldn't do but only that we should shoot for the stars. 
a self-help book can be your best friend and champion, expressing a faith in your essential greatness and beauty that is sometimes hard to get from another person. Because of its emphasis on following your star and believing that your thoughts can remake your world, a better name for self-help writing might be the literature of possibility. Many people are amazed that the self-help sections in bookstores are so huge. For the rest of us there is no mystery, whatever recognizes our right to dream, then shows us how to make the dream a reality, is powerful and valuable. The Books This list of classics is the result of my own reading and research, and might be quite different if another person were to undertake the same project. The focus is on 20th century self-help books, but much older works are also included because the self-help ethic has been with us through the ages. The Bible, the Bhagavad Gita, Marcus Aurelius' Meditations, and Benjamin Franklin's autobiography are examples of works that may not have been thought of as self-help before, but I hope I can argue the case for their inclusion. Most of the contemporary writers are American. And while this may seem like cultural imperialism, in reality self-help values are universal. There are a number of strands to self-help that offer specific guidance, for example on relationships, diet, selling, or self-esteem, but the books covered here relate to the broader personal development aims of self-knowledge and increasing happiness. Through the selections I try to give a sense of the huge diversity of the genre, Many of the titles were easily selected because they are both famous and influential. Others are included because they fill a niche through their ideas. Every book had to have a level of readability and spark that defies the time and place that it was written. At the end of Women Who Run With The Wolves, Clarissa Pinkola is Tess lists a great array of books that might be of interest to readers. She asks, how do they go together? What can one lend the other? Compare, see what happens. Some combinations are bomb materials. Some create seed stock. The same could be said of the self-help classics. However, to help draw out some themes, below I have grouped the works into areas that may help you find what you are after. There is an additional list, 50 more classics, at the end of the book. The Power of Thought, Change Your Thoughts, Change Your Life. James Allen, As a Man Thinketh, Steve Andreas and Charles Faulkner, NLP, The New Technology of Achievement, David D. Burns, Feeling Good, The New Mood Therapy, Daniel Goleman, Emotional Intelligence, Why It Can Matter More Than IQ. Louise Hay, You Can Heal Your Life, Ellen J. Langer, Mindfulness, Choice and Control in Everyday Life, Joseph Murphy. The Power of Your Subconscious Mind, Norman Vincent Peale, The Power of Positive Thinking, Florence Scovelshin, The Game of Life and How to Play It, Martin Seligman, Learned Optimism. Following Your Dream, Achievement and Goal Setting. Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People Deepak Chopra, The Seven Spiritual Laws of Success, Paolo Killo, The Alchemist, Stephen Covey, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, Benjamin Franklin, Autobiography, Shakti Gawain, Creative Visualization, Susan Jeffers, Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway, Maxwell Maltz, Psycho-Cybernetics, Anthony Robbins, Awaken the Giant Within. Secrets of Happiness, Doing What You Love, Doing What Works. Martha Beck, Finding Your Own North Star. How to Claim the Life You Were Meant to Live, Mihalik Six and Mihalai, Flow, The Psychology of Optimal Experience, The Dhammapada, Buddha's Teachings, Wayne Dyer, Real Magic, Creating Miracles in Everyday Life, John Gray, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus, Richard Koch, The 80-20 Principle, The Secret of Achieving More with Less, Philip C. McGraw, Life Strategies, Doing What Works, Doing What Matters, Marianne Williamson, A Return to Love. The Bigger Picture, Keeping It in Perspective. Marcus Aurelius, Meditations, Bothius, The Consolation of Philosophy, Alan de Botton, How Proust Can Change Your Life, William Bridges, 
transitions, making sense of life's changes, Richard Carlson, don't sweat the small stuff. And it's all small stuff, Viktor Frankl, man's search for meaning, Lao Tzu, Tao Te Ching. Soul and mystery, appreciating your depth. Robert Bly, Ian John, Joseph Campbell with Bill Moyers, The Power of Myth, Clarissa Pincola Estes, Women Who Run With The Wolves, James Hillman, The Soul's Code, In Search of Character and Calling, Thomas More, Care of the Soul, A Guide for Cultivating Depth and Sacredness in Everyday Life, Carol S. Pearson, The Hero Within, Six Archetypes We Live By, M. Scott Beck, The Road Less Traveled, Henry David Thoreau, Walton. Making a Difference, Transforming Yourself, Transforming the World. The Bhagavad Gita, The Bible, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Self-Reliance, The Dalai Lama and Howard C. Cutler, The Art of Happiness, A Handbook for Living, Abraham Maslow, Motivation and Personality, Ayn Rand, Atlas Shrugged. Samuel Smiles, Self-Help, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, The Phenomenon of Man. Over to you. In the last analysis, the essential thing is the life of the individual. This alone makes history, here alone do the great transformations take place, and the whole future, the whole history of the world, ultimately springs as a gigantic summation from these hidden sources in individuals. Carl Gustav Jung. Once upon a time we lived in tribal groups that guided our lives and supplied us with our physical, social, and spiritual needs. As civilization emerged it may have been the church or the state that assumed these roles, today, you may depend on the company for which you work for material security and a sense of belonging. Yet history shows that every kind of institution and community eventually crumbles, and when it does the individual is exposed. This is forced change, and as the world speeds up the likelihood of its happening to you increases. Therefore you need to know more about yourself, be aware of how to manage change better, and have a plan for your life that does not depend on an institution. Whether you want to change the world or just change yourself, you are right in suspecting that no one is going to do it for you. In the end, it is all up to you. The other key pressure on us strange as it may seem, is the expansion of choice. Most of us cherish freedom, but when we actually get the opportunity to make our own way it can be terrifying. Many of the works covered in this book, from Philip McGraw's life strategies to Martha Beck's Finding Your Own North Star to Henry David Thoreau's Walden, deal with the paradox that the more choices we have, the greater our need for focus. Anyone can get a job, but do you have a purpose? The 20th century was about fitting into large organizational structures by conforming well you became successful. Yet Richard Gotch shows us in the 80-20 principle that success now and in the future comes from being more yourself, if you are willing to express your uniqueness, you will inevitably contribute something of real value to the world. This has a moral dimension to it, Teilhard de Chardin referred to, the incommunicable singularity that each of us possess, but also makes economic and scientific sense, evolution happens by differentiation, not by matching up to some general standard, and therefore the rewards of life will always go to those who are not simply excellent but outstanding. The future of self-help. I contradict myself. I am large. I contain multitudes. Walt Whitman. At the heart of the self-help literature are two basic conceptions of how we should see ourselves. Titles like Wayne Dyer's Real Magic, Thomas More's Care of the Soul, and Deepak Chopra's The Seven Spiritual Laws of Success assume the existence of a changeless core inside us called variously the soul or the higher self, that guides us and helps us to fulfill a purpose unique to us. In this conception, self-knowledge is the path to maturity. Then there are titles such as Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged, Anthony Robbins' Awaken the Giant Within, and Benjamin Franklin's Autobiography, which assume that the self is a blank slate on which you can write the story of your life. 
There is no one better than Friedrich Nietzsche to sum up this attitude. Active, successful natures act, not according to the dictum know thyself, but as if there hovered before them the commandment, will a self and thou shalt become a self. The self-knowing and the self-creating person are, of course, only abstractions, a person will always be an interesting combination of the two. Both viewpoints, nevertheless, contain the assumption that the self is independent and unitary, one. Yet in the 21st century we have multiple roles, are members of many communities, and express a variety of personas, so our experiences of complexity. Where does self-help fit into such a context? In his book The Saturated Self, Kenneth Gergen suggested that the old idea of the unitary self has had to evolve to take account of our many-mindedness, or what he called the multiphrenic personality. Another writer, Robert J. Lifton in The Protean Self, Human Resilience in an Age of Fragmentation, says that to prevent the feeling of being pulled in all directions we have to develop a tougher and more sophisticated self, aware of all its many dimensions, only this, protean self, will cope with a vastly complicated world. For Lifton, the unitary self is not dead but in a time of challenge. However, will even this more evolved understanding of the self be able to cope with technological advance? What sort of people will emerge from a 21st century that can use genetic and other technologies to alter the personality and increase intelligence? If we will have the ability to change the self to such an extent, what is self-knowledge as Plato imagined it? Scientists are confident that many children born in the next decade will have a life expectancy of well over 100 years, even 140 or 150. Will living that long make your sense of identity more coherent, or will 15 decades of change relationships, families, careers, world events, shatter any feelings of continuity and security? Scarier still is the possibility that we may be able to keep alive the software of our brain long after our body has given up, then perhaps have it transplanted into a new corpus. The ever more sophisticated application of technology to the human body and brain is clearly going to make the question, what is the self? Even more significant. In this blood runner future, the idea of self-knowledge may end up being the historical goal of the post-human human being. Self-help books emerged from the evaporation of certainty and the collapse of tradition. But the literature always assumed that we knew what the self was. As this assumption is questioned, future self-help books will have to be guides to the self itself. Chapter 1 As a Man Thinketh 192 Of all the beautiful truths pertaining to the soul that have been restored and brought to light in this age, none is more gladdening or fruitful of divine promise and confidence than this that you are the master of your thought, the molder of your character, and the maker and shaper of your condition environment and destiny. Good thoughts and actions can never produce bad results, bad thoughts and actions can never produce good results, we understand this law in the natural world, and work with it, but few understand it in the mental and moral world although its operation there is just as simple and undeviating and they, therefore, do not cooperate with it. Law, not confusion, is the dominating principle in the universe, justice not injustice, is the soul and substance of life, and righteousness, not corruption, is the molding and moving force in the spiritual government of the world. This being so, we have to but right ourselves to find that the universe is right. In a nutshell we don't attract what we want, but what we are. Only by changing your thoughts will you change your life. In a similar vein Joseph Murphy, The Power of Your Subconscious Mind, Page 222. Florence Scovelshin, The Game of Life and How to Play It, Page 258. James Allen. With its theme that, mind is the master weaver, creating our inner character and outer circumstances, an in-depth exploration of the central idea of self-help writing. As a man thinketh is James Allen's contribution was to take an assumption we all share, that because we are not robots we therefore control our thoughts and reveal its fallacy. 
because most of us believe that mind is separate from matter, we think that thoughts can be hidden and made powerless, this allows us to think one way and act another. However, Allen believed that the unconscious mind generates as much action as the conscious mind, and while we may be able to sustain the illusion of control through the conscious mind alone, in reality we are continually faced with a question, why cannot I make myself do this or achieve that? In noting that desire and will are sabotaged by the presence of thoughts that do not accord with desire, Alan was led to the startling conclusion, we do not attract what we want, but what we are. Achievement happens because you as a person embody the external achievement, you don't get success but become it. There is no gap between mind and matter. We are the sum of our thoughts the logic of the book is unassailable, noble thoughts make a noble person, negative thoughts hammer out a miserable one. To a person mired in negativity, the world looks as if it is made of confusion and fear. On the other hand, Alan noted, when we curtail our negative and destructive thoughts, all the world softens towards us, and is ready to help us. We attract not only what we love, but also what we fear. His explanation for why this happens is simple, those thoughts that receive our attention, good or bad, go into the unconscious to become the fuel for later events in the real world. As Emerson commented, a person is what he thinks about all day long. Our circumstances are us part of the fame of Alan's book is its contention that, circumstances do not make a person, they reveal him. This seems an exceedingly heartless comment, a justification for neglect of those in need, and a rationalization of exploitation and abuse, of the superiority of those at the top of the pile and the inferiority of those at the bottom. This, however, would be a knee-jerk reaction to a subtle argument. Each set of circumstances, however bad, offers a unique opportunity for growth. If circumstances always determined the life and prospects of people, then humanity would never have progressed. In fact, circumstances seem to be designed to bring out the best in us, and if we make the decision that we have been wronged then we are unlikely to begin a conscious effort to escape from our situation. Nevertheless, as any biographer knows, a person's early life and its conditions are often the greatest gift to an individual. The sobering aspect of Alan's book is that we have no one else to blame for our present condition except ourselves. The upside is the possibilities contained in knowing that everything is up to us, where before we were experts in the array and fearsomeness of limitations, now we become connoisseurs of what is possible. Change your world by changing your mind While Alan did not deny that poverty can happen to a person or a people, what he tried to make clear is that defensive actions such as blaming the perpetrator will only run the wheels further into the rut. What measures us, what reveals us, is how we use those circumstances as an aid or spur to progress. A successful person or community, in short, is one who is most efficient at processing failure. Alan observed, most of us are anxious to improve our circumstances, but are unwilling to improve ourselves and we therefore remain bound. Prosperity and happiness cannot happen when the old self is still stuck in its old ways. People are nearly always the unconscious cause of their own lack of prosperity. Tranquility equals success The influence of Buddhism on Alan's thought is obvious in his emphasis on, right thinking but it is also apparent in his suggestion that the best path to success is calmness of mind. People who are calm, relaxed, and purposeful appear as if that is their natural state, but nearly always it is the fruit of self-control. These people have advanced knowledge of how thought works, coming from years of literally, thinking about thought. According to Alan, they have a magnet-like attraction because they are not swept up by every little wind of happenstance. We turn to them because they are masters of themselves, tempest-tossed, souls battle to gain success, but success avoids the unstable. Final comments Some 100 years after its first publication, As a Man Thinketh continues to get rave reviews from readers. The plain prose and absence of hype are appealing within a genre that contains sensational claims and personalities, 
and the fact that we know so little about the author makes the work somehow more intriguing. To bring its message to a wider audience, two updated versions of the work that correct the gender specificity of the original have been published, as you think, edited by Mark Allen, no relation, and as a woman thinketh, edited by Dorothy Hulst. James Allen Allen was born in Leicester, England, in 1864. At 15 he was forced to leave school and go out to work, his father, who had left for the United States following the failure of the family business, had been robbed and murdered. Allen was employed with several British manufacturing firms until 1902, when he began to write full time. Moving to Ilfracombe on the southwest coast of England, he settled down to a quiet life of reading, writing, gardening, and meditation. As a Man Thinketh was the second of nineteen books that Allen wrote in a decade. Although considered his best work, it was only published at his wife's urging. Other books include From Poverty to Power, By Ways of Blessedness, The Life Triumphant and Eight Pillars of Prosperity. Allen died in 1912.